Hello! Today we'll be responding to common objections you hear in regards to the labor theory of value. For a quick rundown of the labor theory of value, let's mention a few definitions first and then we'll get into the nitty gritty of it. Several terms I'd like to get out of the way. First of all, commodity. A commodity is a product of labor made for sale rather than for direct use. To quote Marx, a commodity is a use value which has a certain exchange value. Now, hmm, two new terms. A use value is the quality of an item which is useful, meets a need, or satisfies the desire that someone has. Everything in an economy has a use value, more or less. That's why it's in the economy, to begin with. An apple pie has a use value because it serves a social purpose of fulfilling a need. A pie made of mud has no use value as it does not serve a social purpose or fulfill a need, unless you're a weirdo. An exchange value is the value of a commodity, product or service produced for sale, as it is bought or sold in the marketplace, so it's roughly the same as price. Price is more specifically the value of a commodity expressed in money, but the differences are subtle and we don't really need to go into this at the moment. So if that is use value, exchange value, price, and commodities, what is value then, exactly? Well, value is the social labor as materialized in the form of commodities. The amount of value in a commodity is determined by the socially necessary labor time incorporated into it, meaning the amount of labor time performed by a worker of average skill and productivity, working with tools of the average productive potential to produce a given commodity, all measured in work hours or other temporal units. There's a lot more nuance to the concept of socially necessary labor time, but I'm trying to keep this quick and simple for now. Now finally, what is the labor theory of value? The general idea is that the economic value of any commodity in a capitalist system of production is determined by the average socially necessary labor time that it takes to produce that commodity. For example, if the average labor time necessary to produce a car is a hundred times as great as the average labor time it takes to produce a loaf of bread, for example, the car will have a value a hundred times as great as that of the loaf. To reiterate, value, not price. The difference is significant between the two terms. Marx, however, completely understands that the actual prices of that car and that loaf of bread might vary somewhat from this ratio for a variety of reasons. But, and here's the core of the matter, the analytical foundation and most basic explanation for the differences in the prices of two commodities will still lie in the different quantities of labor time necessary to make each commodity. This is all explained relatively well in Marx's first volume of Capital towards the beginning, so I do recommend people check that work out. Otherwise, his much shorter essays, Value, Price, and Profit, and Wage, Labor, and Capital, too, are pretty great. With all the definitions out of the way, let's get to the objections, shall we? What you'll quickly come to notice is that the vast majority, dare I say all, counterpoints to the labor theory of value are nothing beyond differing levels of misunderstanding of the labor theory of value, from a gross mischaracterization to inability to keep definitions straight, or the inability to use the correct definitions at all. Regardless, you'll pick up on this soon enough. The labor theory of value hasn't been proven in the real world scientifically. This isn't really one you hear too often because those who bother to make a single Google search will realize very quickly that yes, it has been proven to be valid in relation to the US economy, Swedish economy, German, British, Japanese, and many more. I'll leave the relevant sources and further reading in the pinned comment for those interested. Mud pies. You Marxists claim all labor produces value, yet if I made pies out of mud all day, no value would be produced. This argument is equally funny to me because the term mud pie is used quite often and is the most basic example used to debunk criticism of the labor theory of value. So this means people who use this response have been exposed to the counter arguments but simply chose to ignore them. If you're not familiar with the mud pie argument, it kind of goes like this. Marx claimed that labor is what gives commodities value, but what if I spend hours and hours making a mud pie, so a pie out of mud? This is a product of a lot of labor as I spent a lot of time making it, yet nobody will buy it, so it has no value. Ha, take that, you filthy commie. Um, <laughs> this argument is based off of a fundamental misunderstanding of Marx that a ridiculous amount of people make for some reason. Firstly, the difference between price and value is being ignored here, and so are the laws of the market, for example, supply and demand. Marx is abundantly clear that labor must be useful in order to create value. To quote him, in order that his labor may reappear in a commodity, he must, before all things, expend it on something useful, on something capable of satisfying a want of some sort. So already the argument falls flat. We don't even really need to touch on supply and demand yet because the very first principle that a commodity, that being a use value with an exchange value, is violated as mud pies don't have use values. We'll get into market dynamics in a second. But the subjective theory of value, things are worth differing amounts to different people because they have differing levels of usefulness to them. Appeal to authority. 
Uh, I say appeal to authority because that's all it really is. Uh, economics, especially modern economics, is more an ideological play at justifying capitalism than a true study into the whys and hows of capitalism's functioning, at least when they address the general public. The subjective theory of value, if you're unfamiliar, basically states that the value of a good isn't determined by any inherent property of it or the labor embodied in it, but rather the subjective valuation of you or I and how much we individually value a particular commodity. This is their limp attempt at posing a contender to the labor theory of value. Notice how immediately it's an unscientific theory that relies on an impossible to quantify unit that is subjective desire. Unlike the labor theory of value, where labor inputs and units can all be quantified and mathematically worked with to produce accurate predictions, which again you can refer to the earlier section of the video for evidence for, the subjective theory of value is ridiculous, simple as. Let's take the mental example we used earlier. Think of, for example, a car. What determines its price? You'd say supply and demand. Okay, fair enough. But what if supply and demand are equal? It still has a price, and that price is still higher than, for example, a pencil that also has its supply equaling demand. What determines the price then? Well, the cost of production and the human labor input used to create the car. The subjective theory of value relies on the thirsty man considers a bottle of water much more valuable than a man who isn't thirsty way of thinking. They're confusing value, exchange value, and price. Basically, in the thirsty man, not thirsty man example, it's supply and demand working. High demand for a product, for example, the water bottle, hence yields a high price, but the intrinsic value remains the same. If you attempt to explain prices only at the, oh, I find it this amount of useful and hence it's worth this much to me, then you fail to get to the root of the matter of actually explaining why prices are the way they are. Look, how you and I consider the usefulness of an object doesn't matter. This is metaphysical, unscientific nonsense that is used only because it's ideologically convenient. Go into a car dealership and try to pay for a car through what you deem is its price and watch yourself get kicked out. Whether you think, for example, a sandwich is worth $1 or $100 in price, it doesn't matter. It still has an intrinsic value based off of the cost of production and the labor input. The price can be generally dictated by the value, but this is usually taken as averages across an entire industry, not on single commodity basis. However, the concrete price you pay is influenced too by other factors already mentioned, such as supply and demand, monopolies within industries, etc., etc. The subjective theory of value was adopted by bourgeois economists because the labor theory of value yields some uncomfortable conclusions, and as the priests defending their false idol, economists chose a different idea with barely any explanatory power because it was ideologically convenient. Why? Because it reaches the magnificent, incredibly ideologically convenient of, oh, capitalists don't exploit the workers, it empowers them to produce narrative that perfectly fits into the status quo. The discussion of profit leads into the simple concept of surplus value, which I covered in the previous Socialism 101 video I made. But Marx claimed that value only comes from labor, this is objectively wrong. What about land and resources? This is a straw man argument that you encounter every once in a while too. Nature is also a source of value. Marx says this in the very beginning of the critique of the Gotha program. To quote him, Labor is not the source of all wealth. Nature is just as much the source of use values, and it surely of such the material wealth consists, as labor, which itself is only the manifestation of a force of nature, human labor power. That's about that. What about one-of-a-kind priceless works of art? The food of a sought-after chef? Diamonds? Those that make this argument seem not to be familiar with supply and demand. Again, low supply and high demand result in high prices. This is especially so for priceless works of art. But the original will always be worth more than digitally printed copies. Yes, and that doesn't change the fact that the original work of art is in very low supply, effectively resulting in monopoly prices. There's usually only one of them. Monopoly prices too are a deeper discussion, but I'd like to mention that we also see this in monopolized segments of the economy too. For example, natural monopolies in regards to oil markets. Regardless, back to art. A one-of-a-kind original Picasso, for example, could cost millions, but imagine if Picasso himself painted millions of the same painting. All of a sudden, any one of those same paintings won't fetch such a huge price, now will it? As for the chef example, the services of the chef are in high demand and in low supply. Add on to that the artificial scarcity of his type or style of food, these restaurants are usually status restaurants that place all sorts of restrictions on who is allowed in, and you end up with expensive meals. If his food was being served as school lunches, and you could get it as a takeaway from your local falafel shop, meaning it was in high supply, that's what I'm trying to get at, then the price would be much, much lower. Similarly with diamonds. This is all also overlooking possibly the most common mistake already mentioned when discussing Marx, that being misunderstanding that value and price are different things subject to different organizing conditions. Most of the time, those criticizing the labor theory of value, as in with this case, only think of price while erroneously using the term value and price interchangeably.
The labor theory of value doesn't take into account differences in individual skill levels. Differences in individual skill levels is a silly argument as we don't have artisanal labor in guilds organizing modern industrial production. Under capitalism, the processes of production are incredibly highly developed, and the desire for profit has reduced workers to basically cogs in a machine, doing minute simple tasks that really wouldn't affect the overall productivity of an enterprise, so differing skill levels don't matter too much. Also, Marx always spoke of the social average, the socially necessary labor time that we mentioned earlier. This is an average of the time necessary to produce a certain product, and enterprises that produce that product hover around this average. This is an observable fact. Those enterprises that innovate a faster way of producing will produce below this average, sell their products cheaper, and earn a massive profit, while those that produce above this average will incur losses. Eventually, all successful enterprises within a sector of production will drop down to this new, lower social average by adopting this new, faster or more efficient method of production. Thus, effectively rendering differing skill levels as an objection to be both incorrectly formulated as well as just factually wrong. And with all this said, I think you'd be equipped to handle like 95% of the criticism of the labor theory of value out there. All the rest isn't any stronger or more sophisticated, by the way, it's just deeper misconceptions or misunderstandings on what Marx said that would take longer to debunk, and those that reiterate those criticisms, for example, von Bauer's relatively ineffectual criticisms, are either parroting criticism they don't understand, and as a result are undeserving of your time, or, if informed, are too intelligent to be consciously rely on criticism derived from false pretenses concerning Marx's arguments. Regardless, that's all for today. Let me know if you like these 101 type videos. If you enjoy what I do, then please consider supporting me on Patreon, 